on Kim. Today's May 11th, 2018. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Robert Rusage. Mr. Rusage is a veteran of World War II and has agreed to come down and talk to us about his experiences, not just in World War II, but his life experiences. Uh, this is part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, and we really appreciate you coming down, sir. You're perfectly welcome. I, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this for me. Well, it's an honor, honor for us to have you here. Um, I'm a volunteer at the History Center, and with me today is Kurt Mueller, who is also a volunteer, Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy, and we're really happy to have members of Mr. Ruff's Edge's family. Uh, Ann Citarella, his daughter, and his son-in-law Richard Citarella, and Megan Stewart, his granddaughter. So we appreciate y'all coming down with your uh, famous relative here. <laughs> Would you give me your full name and your current address? Okay, it's Robert E. Ruffsedge. City only. And, well, I live in Peachtree Corners, Georgia. Okay. And where and when were you born? I was born in Brooklyn in, on January the 12th, 1923. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, I, was, I grew up just as a regular kid and uh, when I got to the age like to be a scout, my folks sacrificed, I know, to get me a Boy Scout uniform. Uh, my dad had very menial jobs and my mom used to clean houses, not all the time, but a lot of the time. And uh, this gave me great independence of being able to do things for myself. Uh, for example, I know, well, maybe I should start a little bit differently. Uh, my mother was born in Chicago, and she had German parents. In fact, they spoke German at home. And she moved someplace along the line to New York City. My dad was born near Liverpool, and at the age of 16, he came over to the United States. And I noticed from his uh, records from Ellis Island that he listed his occupation as a baker. Now, 16 years old as a baker, I don't know how much bakery he did, but uh, he had a job, apparently, delivering bakery goods to a chain of bakeries in New York. Cushman was the name of the bakery company. And uh, mom worked in one of the stores, one of the Cushman stores, and although she, I never got this information from her, I kind of figured out that he was making deliveries and she was there maybe getting them, and so this is how they struck up a friendship. Uh, they were married in 1920, and uh, uh, they then lived in Brooklyn at that time, or moved to Brooklyn. I, shortly after that, they moved to Pennsylvania and opened a small rural bakery so maybe this is where the bakery came, came into play with my dad. And I know mom always said and that it was a terrible hard deal for the two of them. Uh, but they must have been halfway successful. They had three or four trucks that they used to deliver uh, to all the rural farms and what have you. And uh, they ha opened two stores in the neighboring towns and, uh, but I think it, uh, it really played on him. I started school there in a one-room schoolhouse. 
Uh, it was quite a long walk from our home to the school, I remember that. I think I went there for maybe two, two years. And between the hard work and maybe financially that it wasn't very lucrative for what they were doing, they decided they were going to leave. Uh, I also think that mom felt that my education there was not what it should have been. So they moved back to Brooklyn. Uh, I remember we, in one of the trucks, I was at this point about uh, six or seven years old. Uh, I remember we left and they only had a dining room set, as I remember, in the truck. And mom had that dining room set almost all the rest of her life. Uh, I guess this was, I, I guess uh, that uh, this was uh, one thing that she felt was very important to her. Uh, I also had a brother, and he was born almost two years before me. His name was Jack, and uh, three weeks after I was born, he passed away from diphtheria. So uh, I always felt that mom must have had a tough time of it, having a little baby and then losing a, a son. <clears throat> she never had any more kids, so I was the only one. And uh, dad always, he got a job when he came back to Brooklyn Again, delivering bread for a large, uh, tasty bread, to tell you the truth. And uh, he delivered that. And I know on, a, on a one or two occasions, he took me with him on his delivery route. And these were back in the days when they delivered bread seven days a week. So this was a seven day a week job. Uh, he never made much, but they never they never seemed to skimp. They were, they were very frugal in everything they did. Um, and so they, they made things very wonderful for me. It was uh, really a pleasure. And mom used to give me great independence to do what I wanted. And I never got into any kind of trouble. Um, I used to go over to New York City by myself on the, on the uh, subway line. Uh, I can remember the line that was near us used to terminate in downtown Manhattan and I would get out there and walk down Broadway uh, to the aquarium which was down at the Battery at that time. Mom would fix me a little lunch, I'd take it on the train get off at the last stop, walk all the way down there, spend the day at the aquarium, come back and go back home. Uh, the fare was five cents in those days. So um, well, that must have been a wonderful place to grow up at, yeah. at that part time when yeah. you could do that. Oh yes, that's right, that's right. Uh, I can remember I had a geography class and uh, in, in grammar school and we used to, the teacher wanted us to have a notebook and uh, to supplement this with pictures of wherever uh, the, the topic happened to be, it might be Africa or Asia or what have you. And of course the kids that got National Geographic, they had all these pictures and they, their notebooks were really fancy. Uh, that was not in my case. So mom said, well, she said, Robert, when you walk down Broadway, there's a lot of shipping companies there, the Canard Line and the White Line and so forth. She says, you go into their lobbies and they will have brochures there and see if you can find the brochures that you need for your book. And so that was, that was wow. what I did. Well, anyway, then when I was 12 years old, uh, mom, just before I was 12, Mom bought me a Boy Scout uniform, and uh, I look. I think back, that must have been a great financial sacrifice for them because this was 
you know, this was expensive in that day and age. And, um, but anyway, that's what she did. I can remember she, we bought it ahead of time. I had it in the closet. And when nobody was home, I tried it on. So, <clears throat> uh, when I was in grammar school, the arithmetic teacher at that time, she said to me, she said, you should take the exam for Brooklyn Tech because I think she would make out good there. <clears throat> so I took the exam and I got accepted, graduated from PS 63 in New York, in, Bro in, in Queens. Uh, I didn't mention that most of my life where I grew up in Queens, actually. Uh, so I started in, in the fall of 1937, and I went there for four years to Brooklyn Tech. Uh, again, ever, uh, I took the train both ways, of course, because it was downtown Brooklyn, five cents each way. And I remember I got an allowance, 75 cents a week, and 50 cents was for car fare. And uh, I flunked one course in Brooklyn Tech. So when it came time to graduate in 1941, uh, I had one course that I had to make up. Uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, in 1940, uh, well, we had a dentist. And he was a officer in the Army Reserves. I think he was a major. And he asked me one time, he said, well, Robert, what you doing this summer? And I, I don't know what I told him, but he says, uh, I got a suggestion for you. He says, the Army runs a program, Citizens Military Training Course, CMTC. And uh, for this, you go one month in the summer for four years. And when you finish that course, you come out as a second lieutenant. So I thought, well, I didn't want to think about the Army. He said, you don't have to do it. He said, he said, just good. He says, it'll give you a whole month in the Army. You'll see what it's like. You may be interested. Uh, but uh, anyway, try it. So I did. I tried it. And uh, I went the summer. It was all right. I, wasn't, I wasn't signing up, that's for sure. Well, I was too young anyway. <laughs> I was 17 years old. But uh, uh, I went and, uh, you know, they had you go through all the things that, I guess, basic, basic training and, and a little bit of marching, a little bit of what, whatever for the one month. Uh, when I came back, this was now 1940, uh, the World's Fair for the second year was, op was open in New York, Flushing, and uh, my buddy and I used to go quite often. The schools in the city had pass books. I think you got 40 passes for two dollars. So that was like a nickel a, an entrance for the, for the World's Fair. And uh, we went quite often just to hang around, so to speak. Well, lo and behold, that's where I met a girl who I married. She was Marie. And we spent so much time together. Uh, Actually, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, she and I were roller skating. And uh, we didn't know anything about it. In fact, there was nothing mentioned at the rink or nothing. And uh, it was a distance from, from our home. So we took the bus and we went home. And, and uh, that's when we heard about Pearl Harbor. Well. My in-laws both came from Ireland, 
uh, had a, eight kids, so they they were older than us. My my wife Marie, or she wasn't my wife at that time. Uh, we, she was the youngest. Uh, we didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was, to tell you the truth. Uh, but we, you know, we just took it and listened to the radio. They had the radio on in the house. Um, the next, the next day was a Monday, and uh, I know I went to went to school, went went to Tech, and. Uh, they had all the students go to the, to the auditorium, as many as could fit in there. Now, Brooklyn Tech is a real big school. I think it's 11 stories high and takes up what would be a city block. Uh, I think there were 11 elevators in the, in, the, in the school. It's there today, uh, and uh, I guess it still has a pretty good rec reputation. My dad said he thought I ought to study chemistry. Well, tech was divided up into a, a program of, of uh, shall I say, technical subjects and, and college prep. That's, that's what you had. And they had chemists and chemistry and they had uh, electrical and they had mechanical and, and architectural. They had an aeronautical, they had an aeroplane there that the, the boys worked on. They built a house in one of the great big areas. Very, very excellent school. Uh, when I was in my junior year, I think it was my junior, well, any, no, it was my senior year, but I had this one lousy subject that I had to make up. So I had to go back to school for that one set war for well for that subject uh, <clears throat> that uh, when I went to school one day one of my buddies there said Gee, I got a job uh, over the summer I said oh yeah this was in in the early spring of 1941 and uh, I asked him where, and he told me it was in Long Island City. And what was he doing? He was going to operate a machine. And he's going to operate, I think in his case, he was going to operate a lathe. And uh, he says, why don't you go, and go over there for an interview and see if you could get in? Well, I was very good in my shop courses. In fact, I was the shop form, student shop foreman in the machine shop. And uh, I thought to myself, gee, I ought to go and see Mr. Blenderman and see if he could give me a letter of recommendation and to take over there. So I, I went over there to see him, and he says, oh, I'll do you one better than that, Bob. He says, we have a Mr. Wagner who used to work for Ford Instrument Company, and I'll have him write the letter so that this will give you an in. So after school, I went to his office. He had the letter all prepared for me. I uh, took the, the subway and what have you to get from uh, downtown Brooklyn over to Long Island City where, the, where Ford Instrument was. Uh, and uh, I went over there with my books and everything else. And when I found this building, it was a long, flat building, no windows, nothing in it, uh, brick. There was just one doorway entrance. And outside this entrance, there must have been 50 men standing there uh, interested in getting a job. And so uh, somebody finally came out and said, uh, okay, fellas, uh, anybody here with any letters of recommendation or anything like that? So I walked up with my letter and my books and what have you and uh, went back and stood in the back because I figured, you know, what's well, I was one of the first ones that he was that was called. I went in. Long story short, I got a job. For as soon as school was over, I would start on the midnight shift, and I would work on a milling machine. Uh, I was getting 85 cents an hour. 
which at that time was very good money. Uh, when I got home, which was very late, mom said, where was I, you know? And I told her, well, I got a job. She says, well, where? And I told her, what are you doing? And I told her. She says, well, how much are you getting? She says, I said, 85 cents an hour. She says, my God, she says, that's more than dead hurts. So wow. those things, I never thought they would bother me, but talking, my, talking about this, I, I kind of feel for it. Uh, anyway, came to, I thought, well, I'll do it for the, for the summer, you know, make a few bucks. Well, I was making out so well, I liked the job and what have you, that when school started for that one subject, I still kept working and then I would go to school after I finished the midnight shift. And uh, I'd go home and sleep and go back to work and I just made the route round and around. And uh, finally I finished. And uh, so that, that was that. that, that took care of me. Um, By this time, of course, the, the CMTC was over with. I don't think they carried it on any further. At least I never heard anything about it. <coughs> uh, the CMTC. The Citizen Military Training, okay. which would the which four years, before, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, again, I think the dentist played a part in this. He told me, because now the war was, the war had started. Um, did I, I don't know if I finished telling you, they assembled everybody down in the, down in the uh, auditorium and we listened to uh, President Roosevelt make the, his, uh, oh. his statement to Congress. Wow, what was the reaction of the students? Well, I think everybody kind of just sat there dumbfounded, you know, they, there was no hooping it up or anything yeah. like that. It was very solemn, shall we say. But it's something you never forgot. Right? No, I haven't, I didn't forget it, no. And um, I know I'm forgetting certain things here that I had written down. Let me ask you a couple of questions before we move forward. You were a young man, young boy, during the Depression. Yes. You know, 29 when the market crashed. Yes. Do you have any specific thoughts about what you, or memories of what you saw and how people reacted and anything that well I'll say this connected to the, with the I depression. think it would, I don't know now and none of the pictures I have indicate a date like this but I think probably sometime around 1928 29 was when my folks moved from Brooklyn to operate the bakery in Pennsylvania so in Greeley, Pennsylvania, the Greeley Bakery. And uh, so we didn't really, I, certainly I didn't experience anything yeah. like that because we were out in a very rural uh, house. Uh, actually the, the, the f uh, oven was in the house for this bakery. And my dad used to uh, this was a daily routine, I guess. Uh, they would get slab lumber, that's the edges of the trees that were milled at the, at the mills, and they would uh, put these, these slabs, the edges of the trees, into, this, into the oven itself and set it on fire. And that would heat the brick in the oven. And then after, I don't know how he ever knew about it, but they would take all of that ash and stuff and push it out the back of the oven. And then uh, they would bake with that residual heat that was in the oven. So this was a case where uh, things that could stand high heat probably got done at first. And then as time progressed and the oven cooled down, they baked things that didn't require so much heat. One other question. You're your father must have been at the age where he would have been 
eligible to participate in World War One. Did, did he serve oh, yeah. in World War One? Yes, he did. Yes, and actually, uh, uh, he served. Uh, I don't know whether he was drafted or volunteered. I just don't know that. But he had his basic uh, uh, training at Camp Upton on Long Island, and uh, after that, he went over to France and he was in the artillery, uh, an artillery division or what have you. But again, he was in the Signal Corps portion of that. Whatever he did, he never spoke about it. Well, I wanted to ask you that, but I guess you just answered the question. It, did, did he ever talk about it at all? Uh, no. No. No, he never, no, he never spoke about it at all. No. He was a very, he was a quiet sort of a fella. Good guy, I thought. Well, that was Never probably. made out, never made much money. Mm. Was very sickly. He had, uh, he had stomach ulcers for years and years and years before they even knew about them, I think, because I can remember as a boy, he used to have bicarbonate of soda all the time. He was, he was taking bicarbonate of soda to ease the pain from, from whatever it was. So your parents were hard workers. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, he had this, we had this farmhouse, shall we call it, there was a barn and we had pigs and a cow, a lot of chickens. And uh, I know that my, one of my uncles, my father's brother, he decided that he was going to try his luck at raising turkeys. So he asked my dad if it would be all right for him to take a little portion of the property and enclose it and put some little sheds up there for turkeys and so forth. And uh, he was just going to do this until Thanksgiving where he thought he would get rid of them. And uh, he worked real hard on that, uh, raising those turkeys. And lo and behold, just before they were ready to, I guess, go to market or what have you, they came down with some kind of a virus and he lost the whole crop. Oh, God. And uh, he had his, his fiance or girlfriend at that time, this is my uncle now, uh, she, she didn't want to marry him until he had $2,000 in the bank. Well, $2,000 back in the, you know, in the 1930, shall we say, that was a lot of money. And then he lost everything with these losing the turkey flock. Well, did she eventually married him, I guess? She eventually <laughs> did marry him. Yeah, that's right. Did he have the $2,000 or did she just... I, I don't know. <laughs> they never had any kids. In fact, uh, my family, I'm the only rough edge left in my particular end of the family. Now, there's a lot, a lot of rough edges, which I never really realized uh, here in the United States. And uh, I'll tell you about that later, but uh, yeah, like there are a lot, like that, to hear about that. a lot of them. And, well, uh, let's move back up to... <coughs> 1941, Pearl Harbor's been attacked, and yeah. the war. Yeah. Talk about uh, your life from that point forward. Okay, well, I kept on working at Ford Instrument uh, all through this period. And uh, actually, I stayed there until I went into the service. I volunteered on uh, November the 23rd of 1942. Uh, the dentist, I think, got me interested in this program with the Signal Corps, uh, whereby we would go to school for, I don't know, at least four months, uh, learning radio and all this kind of thing. And uh, they kind of sold us that, oh, this was going to be a great lead, quite likely you'd wind up as an officer and so forth. It sounded very good. Uh, I went to RCA Institute in downtown uh, Manhattan. Again, I worked all through the period and went to school, which I think was about four hours in the morning. Uh, took the subway from Long Island City to Lower Manhattan, went to school, and then went home, did the same thing. And uh, I finished, finished that school, I'm going to think, probably in... May of 1943, something like that. And uh, 
They called me up on, I went and started on July the 16th, 1943. <clears throat> I uh, went into where I was told to assemble. Uh, I have some pictures of myself leaving the house and all that kind of thing. Um, and we went over to New York City and I, I just can't remember the name. It was quite a, it was an, a landmark place <coughs> which had been taken over <coughs> by, the, by the government. And uh, we went in there and whatever they did to us or what have you, I'm not sure. Uh, I think maybe they gave you a quick uh, health inspection, which was nothing more than, you know, could you walk, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, and one of the things that stuck in my mind that, that bothered me, I, I, I'm pretty sure we got the first inoculation there. I'm not positive of this, but, uh, and you were, uh, you were lined up uh, alphabetical and there was a fellow in front of me and I don't know what his name was anymore, but he was an R and something. And uh, you went to one person and this guy gave you a shot in this arm, you go to the next person, the guy gives you a shot in the next arm, in the other arm. And uh, when, he, when this guy went through, they broke the needle off in his arm. Oh, oh boy, that, that bothered me. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, that was the one thing I remember about that. Uh, we walked from this uh, building to, I guess it was, to Penn Station, I think, because we then got on a train and went to Fort Dix, New Jersey, <coughs> for, uh, for uh, just getting everybody together there. To, uh, there was so many people there, it was unbelievable, but you were put on in what they called a company, and uh, I remember that I happened to wind up in a barrack near where the sergeant of that company was was billeted. And this guy, he was so mean to everybody. And the company street, it must have been five blocks in either direction. And uh, there must have been thousands in that company. And uh, of course, they they had to feed all of these guys, so they were always looking for KPs. I remember, and they asked for volunteers. Well, I knew enough that you don't volunteer, so I I never volunteered. And as time went on, uh, and all these different people were, all these fellows were coming from all over. I guess they were waiting to formulate a unit so that they would ship out from there. Well, while they were waiting for all these people to come, uh, they were dying for KPs, and KP there was, was horrendous because of all these thousands of people. It was a 24-hour feeding deal. So, boy, when you had KP there, you really worked, and I thought, boy, I, I never volunteered Never, but I knew they were breathing down my neck because he came out and he says, if I find anybody who hasn't had KP here, he's going to have it from now until he leaves. So his name was Lydic, Sergeant Lydic, I'll never forget him. And I still didn't do anything. But I noticed one thing. Just in front of where we formed, you know, lined up in the morning, there was a little building there. And uh, they, they, spoke on a, they spoke over a microphone because the street was so long that, that you know, that's the only way they could communicate. And the, the, off, the fellows that were in charge, uh, as I remember, they were corporals. They, they were in charge of the building, uh, which probably housed, I don't know, 50 people until they got this all formed together. And uh, I thought to myself, well, what's going on up there? And he, he would announce, okay, all, all carpenters fall out and all this and everything. I thought, 
hey, that sounds like a good deal to me. So one day I just turned around and I went up there and said I was a carpenter. The guy said, uh, what experience, you're new here, what, what experience you had? I said, oh, I used to help a, a, a man, uh, he built houses. So I, yeah, I've got experience. I said, okay. So he gives me a bag of nails and a hammer. And so he said, you go up a street or two like this. And I, he says, I want you to fix, fix the fence. So I went up there. Well, this must have been going on for years because the boards were so filled with nails, you could hardly find a place to nail the board to the post. But anyway, I did that until, because I didn't want KP, so I did that. And this was easy because if you were out there kind of, there were four or five of us and this great big enclosure banging nails into the fence. And uh, whatever you did though, don't get caught in the PX because that would have killed you. Uh, <laughs> I think you had the system figured out, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I, uh, we finally, we finally, they finally got enough together and uh, little did we know, but this was the start of the 305th Signal Operations Battalion. Did you ship out from Fort Dix? We shipped out from Fort Dix. We got a, tr we got a train, of course, and we went to Camp Tacoa in Georgia. Uh, and of course, this was uh, hot because it was July and what have you. And uh, so when we got there, uh, there were a lot of buildings at that particular point. And we were assigned uh, somehow or another. And, and we come to find out that almost all of the, I'm not gonna say officer positions, but all of the sergeant positions were filled by the cadre that was already there. And these fellas were all New England Bell Telephone employees. So they probably were offered a job you know, f for the military, uh, knowing that they would be probably drafted or called up. And they came in and they filled all the, all the sergeant positions all the way. So there was nothing left uh, for for, you know, we people. Well, I come to find out that I would say, I don't know by now anymore, but I bet you there was 75% of our battalion were these people who went to school just like I did uh, as RCA, because some of them went to New Jersey, some went in Connecticut, out in Long Island, of course, there were probably several of them, not only just RCA, but other yeah. technical schools like this. And uh, uh, so anyway, we got there and uh, it wasn't too bad. Basic training wasn't too bad. Uh, we did a little bit of dr a little drill and a lot of marching up and down and physical training and what have you. Um, but you knew at the time you would be shipping overseas, I assume. Oh, I, oh, yeah, I figured that, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we, I was there until I believe, I believe it was October the 1st. So that was from July 15th, more like August 1st to October 1st. Uh, and I happened to have at that time, I had, we were at the rifle range. So we were, we were practicing shooting, you know, with rifles. And at this particular time, my time was down in the pits, as they called it, where you used to raise and lower the, the target. And uh, you know, they put up the target, and the guy would shoot and you'd pull the target down, and you'd see where the bullet hole, bullet hole was, and then you had a long, <coughs> a long stick with a disc on it, and when you raised the target back up, you held it over the bullet hole. 
so that back at the back at the shooting range, they could see where that where that where he had hit. So I was down there doing this up and down with the. There were a bunch of us, probably, you know. Must have been twenty or thirty uh, uh, targets up at any one time. Uh, all of a sudden, I got called back to the company office or whatever, and I found out that I was one that had been chosen to go to Fort Monmouth for what I call advanced training. Well, this was, this was a great deal because coming Fort Monmouth was North Jersey and, and coming from, you know, New York City, basically, uh, I'd be able to get home and so forth and so on. Um, so there was about a dozen of us that, that went up there, and uh, we were there for, I believe it was four months. It was, anyway, it took us up, took us up to about, I'm going to say February the 1st of 1943, 44, 44. And when did you eventually ship out? Well, I shipped out in, I, 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 I don't know the date. But, but I would say that it was probably February or March of 44. Okay. And we went on the uh, Normandy, which was a beautiful cruise ship. Uh, it so happened that uh, we were the last or one of the last troops to load onto that ship. And so the result was we all were down at the very lowest level in the ship. And in my particular case, it was not only the lowest level, but I was up at the very, very front. And uh, the sides of, the, of, the, of this area were sloped, just like, like a, you know, you visualize a ship. And the bunks were all along every, the whole outer surface of the ship was lined up with bunks. And I think there was either four or five high. Uh, the first one, the lowest one was maybe about six inches off the floor. And then they probably had it figured out, you know, if you needed 18 inches or something like that. So that was, that was where you were. Uh, it so happened that we, it was fortunate in that we could now take our duffel bags and put them on the lower bunks because there were extra bunks and, but that's not the real thing. The sides of the ship totally sweated all the time and water was continually dribbling down the walls and sloshing across the floor. And so that's why it was so good that we were able to put our duffel bags on that first bed, keep them dry. Food wasn't very good, and once again we went through this business, we need KPs. Well, I, not, that wasn't me. Boy, I wasn't going to get KP. So I don't know how, but I finally determined that they were getting close to, to our outfit being the KP. So they again asked for volunteers and electricians. So now I became an electrician. And I went up there and they asked me what kind of experience. I told them I had worked for an electrician. I was pulling wires and so forth and so on. They said, okay. Uh, anyway, my job on the ship was they gave me a, a sort of a, a pouch or what have you filled with light bulbs. And I would walk around the ship, and if I saw a light bulb out, I replaced the bulb. So that was my job. Never had KP, but... Uh, That's a pretty good job. Uh, yeah, that wasn't bad at all. <laughs> food was yeah, terrible. Food, oh, yes. <laughs> food, was, food was terrible. 
And uh, I don't know, it doesn't seem like to me I worked every day. I mean, it might have been every other day or something like that, but it didn't take up too much time. And uh, I, <clears throat> because of the fact I didn't, I knew enough about a boat. So as soon as I woke up in the morning, I would go upstairs to the top deck and get in the middle of the boat so that I figured as the boat goes like this, the middle is the least rocking, and so I wouldn't get seasick, which I did. I, I did not get seasick. Uh, there was one very interesting thing. Uh, we went overseas, we went over to Europe un unescorted. There was no escorting with that ship. And we were told, don't ask me who or how, that it was because this ship could travel much faster than, than convoys that would be escorting us. And uh, when we got on the ship, it was cold. We had our heavy jackets on, and little by little it kept getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And finally, we're, we're, we don't have any, no, nothing on the top whatsoever. Uh, and uh, I have figured out, we didn't know it at the time, but this ship must have taken a detour going from New York, maybe all the way down to the Bahamas or something, and then across, because uh, of course the North Atlantic, I guess, was pretty dangerous yeah. with submarines and what have you, and so this way they avoided that. And so we went down there, and then, then it got cold again, mm -hmm. and we landed in Glasgow, Scotland. So, uh, Talk about your experiences from the time you landed through all the different areas you traveled to, because I've read that you pretty much went everywhere east you could go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we took the train. Uh, I, didn't, I never did get into the part that after after the basic training and, and, uh, and that I had gone to Fort Monmouth, the rest of the outfit went on maneuvers in uh, Tennessee through the winter. And uh, evidently it was a terrible, terrible winter because these guys really, really suffered in, that, in their maneuvers that year. Uh, I was so fortunate in, in being in, in Fort Monmouth uh, we got weekend passes. Uh, one, one weekend a month you had to stay as a fire brigade. Other than that, you were free to go wherever you want. So we went home every weekend. I was home for Christmas. I was home for Thanksgiving. Uh, oh, it was, it was the cat's meow, boy. I, I made out again like a bandit. Uh, and then when we, when we, when I finished that, when I finished that, I re rejoined the 305th. By this time, they had finished maneuvers, maneuvers, and had moved to Camp Crowder, Missouri, and that's where I joined up with them again. Uh, <clears throat> it wasn't too pleasant out there. They they made things kind of miserable. I think they made it miserable, so he'd be glad to get going again. Uh, we went from there to, uh, let's see, did we go to Dix? Well, anyway, we wound up in, in Kilmer and some little interesting things there. At Camp Kilmer, they, they, they trained you for boarding the ship, boarding the train. Everything was very mechanical. Um, and uh, one of the things was they, took you up to a, a large, I'm not going to say a tower, but a, maybe four or five story high uh, platform that you were up there. And down the one side of the, of the platform were cargo nets and also ropes that kind of hung out from the, from the, from the uh, platform. And the idea was they had you practicing going down the cargo nets in case you had to abandon ship uh, when you were going overseas. Well, I, I learned one thing, and I, I just saw it recently here. 
one of our politicians is shown climbing a sort of a cargo net. I don't know what his name is. And, uh, you know, he's acting like he's a, he knows it. He knows the military and what have you. And one thing about going down a cargo net is you never hold on to the horizontal ropes. You always hold the verticals so that you know, the guy above you doesn't step on your hands. Well, the guy in this TV ad, if you look at it, you'll notice he's holding the horizontal strips. Uh, yeah, I've got to, got to watch for that. Yeah, that's right. I, I don't know which fella it is, but... Uh, so anyway, uh, and then, then they, they lined you up and you had to be exactly in the right spot for boarding the train. They had trains there and you actually went through the drill of boarding the train. And you got on the train and you sat in a certain seat. And when you got out of that seat, you went out. So that now when you got onto the train to go over to New York to get the, in my particular case, uh, the, uh, uh, what was the name of the ship? Normandy. The Nor Normandy. Uh, you got out of the train, you walked to the gangplank, and he says, Rough's Edge. And you said, Robert E. Next guy was whatever, and, and you just, that's the way you did, so that they didn't leave anybody out and nobody had disappeared. So anyway, but then I told you about going down to the bottom of the ship and all that kind of stuff. What was your first impression when you landed in England and got off? In Scotland? Scotland? Well, again, uh, the train was right there, practically right at the boat. We didn't have any, uh, any uh, little launches or anything. The boat was able to go right up to the dock. And you got out and you practically walked across the platform and got a train. And we all went down into Bracknell in England, uh, which I'm guessing was maybe, and, and still is, I imagine, about 25 miles uh, that would be west of London. And uh, well, take us through your journey through Europe. Your through Europe. Okay. Uh, well, let me. I gotta say. I got say something else here first. Uh, while in while in Bracknell, we were we were in a, like an estate, and we were living in Quonset huts. Uh, I remember that while we were there, all of a sudden we started to see some new uh, men coming into the outfit. And it so happened that apparently we were not quite up to strength, so we needed some more people in there. And there were two people in particular, well actually there were three that were of very interest to me. Uh, one happened to be our platoon sergeant, his name was De Haas, and he was a rotten SOB, I'll tell you. <laughs> he was regular army and he treated us like you know what. Um, the, another guy uh, was Oki Radcliffe. Uh, De Haas came in as a buck sergeant. Oki Radcliffe came in as a master sergeant. Now this really sent the other sergeants into turmoil because he filled the table of organization with a master sergeant rank. And they, he came in and came as the head of the platoon command uh, for us because he was a master sergeant and there were no other master sergeants. Well, Oki was a little short fella and I have pictures of him, you'll, you'll see him. Uh, I don't think he was, if he was five foot four, he was big. And he was no more a master sergeant than you, Sue. I'm telling you, he was so gentle and so calm and never gets excited. And he just wasn't, he just, well, I, however he got to be a master sergeant, I'll never know. But, uh, uh, anyway, we were there in Bracknell, and he took care of us. And while we were there, we got all the telephone equipment. 
switchboards, the old patch cord switchboards. And uh, I think we had four uh, truck trailers. They were empty. And every day we would go to another area and those people that were in like the uh, uh, central office equipment part of our outfit, they would install these, these, these uh, telephone switchboards because we were going to be operating these. And then other people were mounting uh, terminal strips for wire terminations and cross-patching them from the outside of the trailer over to the, over to the switchboards. And um, so this, this is what we did. And one little side thing, which I'll make, if I remember to tell you, we, we I, was I was going to be a telephone installer. And uh, we didn't know what we were going to be doing, but they, they gave us a lot of equipment that, uh, that went into a sort of a pouch that they gave us to carry, slung over your shoulder and what have you. And there was a little, there were keyholes and saws and, and pliers and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, we filled them out. And, and while we were there, we got trucks. Now the interesting thing about the truck was we were, most of us got three quarter ton trucks. There were two or three men to a truck. And um, there was also a lot of Jeeps for, uh, uh, for the group, uh, what was their name? Anyway, they, they, uh, they, they were the ones that were to deliver messages and things like that. Uh, you know, where it had to be handled by people. And uh, these, these fellows, they were off in a different area. But anyway, we, we got it all together. And finally, about nine days after VD Day, v, uh, uh, yeah, VD Day, um, we pulled out. We left Bracknell and uh, went to Southampton. And I remember we parked alongside the roads, put up our camouflage uh, nets overhead, and sat there for several days just waiting. And uh, <clears throat> finally we got a, we, since we had a truck, my other, my other buddy and I, uh, we were able to drive these trucks onto the LST, which was taking us across. Well, the one thing that was always struck me, and, and it was quite a, to me it was a deal, you had to back all of this equipment onto the, onto the ship. You went off backwards so that when it came time to get off, you drove straight out. And that was quite, a, that was quite an undertaking. Uh, those fellows that had to back those trailers uh, up into the, because that, well, that was the type of thing that was aboard the LST. And uh, we landed on Omaha Beach and drove off and... I want to be sure I've got the right uh, time period here. This was after June 6th. This right. Was after, uh, yeah. Uh, you said VD Day, but after we took the beaches. Yes, that's right. Okay. That's and, right. And about how many days after, and approximately? You have any uh, about nine, I think nine. it was. Okay, so about know. nine, okay. yeah. Okay. So it was like around around the fifteenth sure. of, okay. of of. I just wanted to be sure that was clear on the yeah. record. So just. Uh, and uh, we drove on. Now, the other part of the outfit that didn't have trucks, for example, those fellows that were in the telephone platoon, which were the ones that were going to operate the switchboards. They weren't in a truck, so these fellows went over on small boats uh, to to land on the on the beach, and the uh, the weather was quite rough, and those those guys got deathly sick, uh, you know, in that terrible thing. On the LST, I know I didn't get sick, and well, anyway, that that was that. But we went, uh, we went a few miles from, from Omaha Beach and uh, 
went and parked again our vehicles around the hedgerow, put up our camouflage tents, nets, and uh, I remember the first night that we were there, I had guard duty. And that was a little scary because there was, there was gunfire around and, and, and uh, you could hear that there was, you know, it wasn't all peaches and cream. And I have to admit, it was a little, a little frightening. And uh, one of the things was the area that I happened to be patrolling was past the kitchen supply truck or whatever. I don't remember now exactly what it was. And so I thought, boy, God knows what's going to happen here. And I went in and I swiped a, a can of Spam. I think it was a five-pound can of Spam. It was about that long and, you know, square like a like Spam. Uh, when we were in back in Bracknell and had these trucks, there were little compartments along the sides. And my buddy and I decided we were going to start to stock up on supplies. So every time the PX was, when we were able to buy stuff in the PX, <coughs> we would get all we could and stash it away in these cubby holes on the truck. <coughs> Cigarettes, candy, soap, and toiletries, you know, all that kind of stuff. We stashed it all away. So uh, the can of Spam went into one of those compartments also. Uh, we went to a field outside of Peria, uh, just like the Peria water, and uh, we was we put our pup tents up in a large field, and we stayed there. And of course, it was hot. And the one thing I remember there so vividly was that there were there were yellow jackets all over the place. And you get your mess gear, and these yellow jackets would practically cover the food. You'd have to go like this to wave the, the yellow jackets away so you could get the food into your mouth. Uh, I don't know how long we were there. Uh, Oki, who was the master sergeant, apparently he went off someplace and found a German rifle and was shooting it. And I'm going to say he got caught, and they broke him to private. Wow. So now it so happened that Oki joined our team. And he was the nicest guy you ever wanted to meet. I'm not done with Oki. He'll come along. But anyway, he, uh, he, was, he was really a good worker and uh, just, just a nice fellow. And uh, we stayed there, and we moved then to Laval. And Laval, the headquarters, was a large, I'm going to say, probably a military school. Uh, I don't remember how many stories high, but you know, it was four or five stories high. And uh, uh, they had a swimming pool in there, and a big shower area. Uh, we were, we set up our pup tents in an apple orchard not too far from there. And uh, we started to run all of our wires and stuff and set up the headquarters. Um, I don't remember how long we were exactly there, but all of a sudden I noticed that the organization had changed. Uh, we had three companies in 305th. There was headquarters, Company A and Company B, and Company A and Company B were exactly the same. I mean, they had a telephone platoon, they had a construction, they had an installation and repair, uh, they had a central office, they, what have you. Exactly the same. All of a sudden, all of their, I was in the installation and repair section, platoon. All of a sudden, they combined the two Company A and Company B platoons. I guess they found that it was easier for control of the men 
rather than having two separate and distinct companies, that operation was done by. So I was in Company B, along with I think the telephone com telephone platoon and the construction platoon. So that was that was Company B, and Company A was message center and what have you. I don't know where the cooks and the we had a very large motor pool, of course, with all these trucks because uh, they were always uh, changing oil and what have you in them. Um, anyway, we went to we went to Laval, and uh, part of the outfit then moved ahead to Versailles, and they set up headquarters in Versailles while they were still in Laval, the headquarters that is. So when they got the headquarters set up in Versailles, then the headquarters moved to, Ver to Versailles, okay? And those that were left behind had to strip out all the stuff that they had done there. I'm not going to say they took out every foot of wire or everything like that, but all the cables were taken down and all the telephones were collected up, the double E8 uh, phones, you've probably seen them in, in war movies. Um, and uh, we got that all done, and then I guess they weren't ready for us quite to move again. So we had a lot of free time on our hands. Uh, my buddy and I went into town one day, and I got the strongest urge I wanted a tomato. I just wanted to have a tomato. So we went down into town, there was a group of boys there at one point, and uh, we went over and I asked them anybody uh, where I could get tomatoes. Of course, I didn't speak French, they didn't speak English, but there was one boy there that spoke English. And so he said, uh, <coughs> he said, uh, he introduced himself and said that he thought that maybe his mother could get, get a tomato, get some tomatoes. So he took us home to his house, and his mother came out, and here she is, a perfectly, beautifully speaking English lady. Wow. And uh, she, you know, asked what and what have you, and I said, I was just wondering whether or not you would be able, or where we could get some tomatoes. And she said, well, I can't, I don't have them here right now, but if you come back, I don't know, two days later, I'll have some tomatoes for you. So I said to her, well, what, can, what would you like? She says, I would just love a cup of tea. Huh. So I thought, well, when I go back, I'll see what I can do. I went to the mess sergeant, told him the story about the tomatoes and the woman, and I said, do you have a little bit of tea that I could give to this lady? He said, yeah, we got some tea around here someplace. He goes into the mess tent, and he must have come out with at least a two or three pound bag of tea. Yeah, and uh, I said, can I have a little? He said, take the whole thing. He says, that's not enough for us to, to work with. So you can have it. Well, when I went back and brought that bag of tea to that lady, she, she cried because she was so thankful. And she had a nice little bag of tomatoes really? for me. Uh, come to find out, she was married to a doctor. And she had uh, actually married him in Paris, and that's where he, his practice was. Well, the Germans, they needed a doctor in, in, in Laval, so they turned around and forced them to move to Laval. And that's where, of course, I was. And they, that evening when we went, when my buddy and I went back, uh, they had some in very interesting things to tell us. And they said, now, when you go back, be careful, because we're sure that there are still Germans hiding out in various houses in town. So now it's pitchy black. Yeah. And so they said, just be, just be alert, just be alert. Wow. Uh, we left, we didn't run into anybody, but uh, that was the situation. Yeah. She said that the military that had been stationed in Laval they dispersed, they dispersed them all through the houses so that there was no uh, main conglomeration yeah. of troops yeah. uh, uh, for bombing and so forth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, shortly after that then, 
And this brought us to about, uh, I think it was maybe September. We went and we jumped over the people that were in Versailles and we went to Verdun. And that's where we started to set up headquarters. Uh, the, the Verdun headquarters were entirely different. Uh, they were in a great big uh, uh, wall enclosed area uh, with many, many buildings in there. And when we first got there, which wasn't a lot of people at that time, uh, we, had, we used to go around in there and see what was what. Well, in one building, it was filled with uniforms, German uniforms. Another one would have all helmets. They would have bayonets. Uh, all of, the, all of the, the hand guns, they had put grenades, um, incendiary grenades in them, and they fused them all together so that the guns were not usable. But uh, anyway, that was that. Uh, after we got the, got the place set up again, it was a very repetitive what we did. You know, we'd run the wires, we'd install the phones, and then we'd clean it up, and we repaired it as need be when the, when the wires got broken or, or what have you. So you were setting up the communication system for that area as you moved across Europe. That is right, yeah. that's right. And so we were there for quite a while uh, actually, uh, the, I don't know what you'd call it, I, I'm, for lack of knowledge, I, I'll say the, the call letter or whatever, we were called Eagle. And this was General Bradley's headquarters. And so Bradley had Hodges and Patton for the 1st, 3rd, and 9th Army. I can't remember what the other general's name was, but Hodges and Patton were two of them. And Bradley, of course. <clears throat> and uh, so anyway, we, we set up the, we set it all up, and they moved us out of the inside the wall to a building outside of the enclosure. And uh, this was a, I think, a four or five story building, and the front of the building was totally panels of glass, all glass. So this must have been, again, some kind of a, a uh, billet for something. I don't know what, uh, by the French, which then the Germans had taken over. Uh, the front then was nothing but hallways. Uh, you went in the, in the middle and you went right or left on the first, second, third, fourth floor. And off of those hallways were rooms. And in those rooms, uh, I would say that we were able to put, oh, 30 men, two, two, two upper and lower bunks. And uh, that's where we operated from. We, were, we had to maintain the lines and all that sort of stuff. And, we were there, I'm going to say, until the beginning of 45, I would think it was. And uh, then what happened, the people at Versailles got finished, and they skipped, jumped over us and went to Luxembourg City. And they set up uh, the headquarters in Luxembourg City. Uh, and so we used to go back and forth to help them out in Luxembourg because uh, it wasn't that great a distance, you know. And I know at one point I went to Luxembourg and uh, they then sent me to Namur, Belgium with a small contingency. And, but we weren't there very long. We had to go through Bastogne uh, to get to, to Namur. But, the, but this was before the Battle of the Bulge. Oh, okay. So we were there before oh. that. So we went up there and we went to Namur and 
I can't remember anything about that. I have a couple of pictures of the area, but uh, I don't know what we did. I don't know where we stayed. I, 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 I don't remember anything about it. It wasn't very long, and we went back to Luxembourg City. And while we were, while we were back, uh, back there, and then I went back to Verdun, and finally then we made the jump and we went to Wiesbaden. Oh. So we jumped over Luxembourg. Okay. And um, now when you, it was Belgium or Germany your next stop? Well, we went, went to, went to, I went from Verdun, France to Luxembourg mm -hmm. to Belgium. Then to Belgium, okay. <coughs> then back to Luxembourg. Okay. Okay. Then back to Verdun. Because I don't know what my assignment. I can't. Oh, yeah. I can't remember that yeah. portion. And then we jumped over the Luxembourg people and went to went to Wiesbaden. Okay. And so we were the first ones there in Wiesbaden. Tell me what you saw when you got into Wiesbaden. Wiesbaden. I know it's very badly bombed out. Uh, I've got pictures to show you. Uh, the railroad yards were total disasters. Uh, uh, I know one thing that I was, I'm a stamp collector, and one of the things I was always keeping my eyes open for was for stamps. And uh, I know I went down to, the, down to the railroad station, and I found that there were pigeonholes filled with little, all similar slips of paper. In other words, if you were to collect up all the slips of paper that the mailman leaves uh, and then, uh, you know, and you bring back for a registered letter or something, mm -hmm. and all of these things had stamps on them. Gosh. All of these. <coughs> but they were all the same. So yeah. it, didn't, it didn't, mean, didn't mean very much. Now, I have, to, I have to back up here a second. Before we left Verdun, uh, I had a... I had a wash lady there, and she did my, not me, but a lot of us did our clothes. She didn't charge anything if you just brought her the bar of soap. Wow. And here I had all the soap in the cubby hole of my truck. Mm. And so we freely gave the soap to her. She had three or four daughters, as I remember, and uh, they used to call me Grand Robert because I was tall. Yeah. And uh, one day I go to pick up my pick up my laundry, and they're French, you know, and I don't French. And I'm wondering what happens. Well, they come out, and apparently one of the daughters had forgotten the iron on my pants, and here they had burnt a perfect iron hole in my pants. And they were, I guess they were thought, boy, well, you know, what he could do, shoot us or what have you. But anyway, they were very, very frightened of that. And I told them it was all right. When I got back, I took them to the supply sergeant, and he gave me a new pair of pants. And, but shortly after that, there was an announcement made that any damage to clothing like that, you were going to have to pay for your, your replacements, but I got my free pants. Anyway, her husband worked for the railroad, and of course, since the Verdun yard was all bombed out, uh, he was out of work, and uh, they were struggling, you could tell. And uh, when I left, I gave them the five-pound can of ham spam, and they were so thankful. So you saw a lot of people really suffering, I guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I have pictures there. Uh, it so happens that my brother, my two brother-in-laws were in a railroad battalion for the U.S., of course. And uh, we used to talk on the phone because I had access at nighttime. We could make calls. And I found out where they were, and I spoke to them. And one day I get a phone call, and here they are. They came to Verdun. So they were in Verdun at the same time that I was, and uh, we had a, one night, in fact, probably 
the drunkest in my life. I got so drunk. I don't know how I ever managed to get back to my headquarters. <clears throat> I picked up a cat along the way, and I carried this cat back, and, and I thought, and I'm walking along the road, and I'm saying, stop talking to yourself. People will think, pitch black. People will think you're crazy, you know? And, and, then, uh, and, then, and, then, and then Tommy and Billy, right. And so anyway, I finally get back to the billets, and I go up into the building, and I thought, now is all I got to do is sneak into the room, fall into bed. So I push on the door and boom, you know, I lost my balance. The door crashes. They all look up. Here I am <laughs> in terror with a cat. <laughs> okay, Rob said, you got to take care of this cat. You got to take care of this cat. We're not going to have no cat in here. So, uh, okay, that, that, that was that. Well, there was another fellow in the outfit came from Georgia. He was one of these replacements that we picked up along the line. His name was Gibson. and every go, Everybody called him Hoot, you know, for the cowboy actor back in those days. Hoot Gibson. And also attached to the headquarters, there was a WAC unit. And they, the WACs did the you know, clerical, I guess, secretarial work and so forth for the officers. And uh, Hoot was a real ladies' man, boy. He always had a girlfriend. And finally, he got one of the wax to take the cat. So that was how I got rid of the cat. <laughs> so anyway, that takes me, takes me out of her done. And basically, we went up to, up to Wiesbaden. And again, we set up the headquarters. Uh, on when I no sooner... When we first landed in, in France, they came around and said, anybody here would, has reason to want a furlough back to England uh, for whatever reasons. Well, I don't think any of our guys got married. I don't think so anyway. But they, they were guys. And I put in because my grandfather told me that if you ever can get to see, get to England, you want to go up there to Liverpool, and he gave me the address, and see Aunt Maggie. And uh, if you, she's not there, you want to go visit Aunt Millie. So, lo and behold, I no sooner get to Wiesbaden, and my number comes up to go on a furlough. Uh, there were three of us. Uh, as I gathered, there was one fellow from the headquarters company he was in, in the medic group, so he was in the headquarters group. The other guy was from central office, and so he was in, country, in company A, and I represented company B. And so the three of us then headed back to England for a, for a week's furlough. It took us about at least three weeks to get to London. Uh, on our way back, uh, we went by truck, we went by train, and finally they take us to a small town on the coast of France, Etretat. Now, Etretat happens to be the birthplace of General de Gaulle. And uh, this was very, very heavily fortified. Uh, it's hard to explain. It was a kind of a shore, uh, horseshoe-shaped uh, shoreline at this particular point, and at the ends of the, at the and cliffs, high cliffs, which then dipped down to be right down to the sea. So it must have been a fishing village, um, I think. But they had carved out gun emplacements up on these cliffs, so that they had crossfire down onto the beaches. Uh, the beaches had all sorts of. Uh, 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 emplacements for landing craft so that they would hang up and what have you yeah. there. But uh, that was very, very interesting. But the interesting part about this was the, the, the government, the United States government, took over the whole town. Everybody, they moved everybody out. Don't ask me where they went. And when you got there, everybody got totally new clothes. Totally everything from soup to nuts everything. 
And uh, because now we were going back to, to London and they didn't want us grubby old guys going look like a bunch of bums. So they gave us all new uniforms and everything there. Well, did you uh, see your relatives? Oh, yeah. So uh, we then went from Etretat to, a, to a, a camp. I don't know what it was, but they were all named for cigarettes. There was Camp Camel, Camp Tarrytown, Lucky Strike. I don't know whether Paul Mall was at that time, but that's what they were. So we went. I, I think I was in Lucky Strike. And when we were there, they, uh, you just assembled there. We, got, we went then to La Havre, got the ship, got to Southampton. Southampton, the train was raiding, waiting. Off we went to London. When we got to London, our furlough started. So I then got on the, I got on the train and went to Liverpool. I got up to Liverpool, I guess it was early afternoon, maybe lunchtime. And I found out how to get to Aunt Maggie's house. So I take the tra buses, a couple of buses, get to Aunt Maggie's, no answer. The neighbor comes out and she says, oh, she said they just took her to the hospital this morning. So she wasn't available. So now I had to double my way back to go over to Wallasey, which was across the Thames River in, in Liverpool, and go over to try to find Aunt Millie. So by this time now, it's late in the afternoon. In fact, when I get to the other side waiting for the, for the ferry that took us over there, it was, it was dark. It was dark. And lo and behold, I get there, and I missed the last bus that went past Aunt Millie's house. So there was a workman there, and he said, he says, I hear you've got a little trouble. He said, but I'll tell you what, if you come with me, I'll tell you where to get out, and you'll be able to walk a little distance, and there's Vaughan Road. Uh, that's where she lived, I remember. And so uh, that's what I did. I got out there. By this time, it must have been, oh, 9, 10 o'clock at night, I would imagine, pitchy black. Uh, how I ever found the house, I, I can't tell you. I don't, I don't think I had a, I don't know. I just don't know. But anyway, I knock on the door. All of a sudden, the window opens upstairs, and she says, who's there? And I said, this is Robert Ruffsed from the United States. Oh, she said, well, I don't know. The old girl must have slid down the banister or something because she was at that front door so quick. I, I don't know how she ever got there so fast. And she was the nicest lady, had a wonderful five days, I guess it was. Wow. Uh, we went up to visit her daughter in the neighboring town. And the one interesting thing there that happened was <coughs> she was in the, more in the country outside of Liverpool, and she had access to eggs. Now, back in London, there were, uh, back in Liverpool, there weren't any eggs. So I remember she put don't ask me how many dozens of eggs, in a bucket and filled it with water. And I carried that bucket full of water with eggs for her back to her house so that they had, so that they had eggs. Gosh. So then I went back. It took, it took about a week or so to, to get back and on my, to go back to Wiesbaden. And during that time, uh, the 8th of May was VE Day in Europe, and I happened to be in, in Luxembourg. Well, Luxembourg was a very good city. It, it was the one city that, I, I don't know, that had ice cream. So that's the one thing I remember about Luxembourg. So anyway, I kept on going, going further up. <coughs> I stayed over with the part of our outfit, even though I wasn't a so, a tied to them, that was stationed in Luxembourg. Well, remember I told you that one of the things back in Europe we had, we made these pouches that had a brace and bit and a keyhole saw and so forth and so on, which we never used. I mean, you know, just, you just didn't use it, that's all. So what the guys did was they took all the tools out of, the, out of these pouches and they went into the headquarters where all the officers were. 
and downstairs was a wine cellar and a liquor liquor supply, and they took these these bags and filled them up with booze, and you know, <laughs> perfectly normal. Never used a thing before or after. So uh, anyway, the guys, some of those guys, really got sloshed. I'm telling you, boy, for VE Day. Anyway, then I moved on up to went back up to Wiesbaden, and. Uh, I guess we were there a couple of months, <coughs> and all of a sudden they told us that uh, <coughs> we were going to be leaving, and we were going to be going to the Pacific, uh, and we were going to be uh, attached to an armored division. So uh, that's what our destination was. Uh, we would go to south of France, go through the Suez Canal to the Pacific, and we were issued a number. Uh, the outfit was issued a number, and uh, let's say, just for conversation, let's say it was 400. Uh, and it seemed like, and you, and you put this number on everything, on your bags, on the trucks, everything had that 400 number on it. And all of a sudden we're starting to see other outfits coming through. and. Uh, might be 395. Then we'd see 396. Well, Wiesbaden was a little bit of a hub at that particular point, and so they would go through Wiesbaden to wherever we were going. So finally, we're getting up to like three, 398, and so we're figuring, oh, we're leaving here shortly because they're getting to 400. That's when we're going to leave. Just before they get to 400, they tell us they've had a change of plans. Yes, we're going to the Pacific, but we're going through the States. Wow. Now you can imagine Gosh. how we felt about that. That was a real deal. So anyway, uh, our outfit then traped back just about the same way that I went on my furlough. We went to Verdun and trains and this and that. No Etretat, but we, we, at that point, we went to Camp Tarrytown. And there we turned around and they made us get rid of all the stuff that we weren't allowed to bring, you know. Some guys had bullets and all kinds of things like that and had to get rid of all of that. And we, uh, we then finally went to Le Havre, just like we did for the furlough went to Southampton, and then we, the outfit moved to Camp Barton Stacy. Now Barton Stacy was, a, was an armored camp where General Patton had been before the invasion. And we were there, and gosh, we were there for a long time, weeks, weeks, and you had daily passes and everything. And just like the military, all of a sudden, you got word that we were going back to the States on the Queen Mary. Well, the next thing you know, again, grapevine, up oh, the Queen Mary just sailed. So we weren't on that one. Queen Mary's back. Queen Mary sailed. <laughs> so finally, finally, all of a sudden, we moved out. Lo and behold, we went on the Queen Mary. But we were one of the first troops on the Queen Mary. So we were up the top, and uh, they they assigned us to to rooms, which of course were all filled with bunks. But because they wanted to get as many troops as possible on there, uh, they did it that there were not enough bunks for the number of people. So one night you slept in a bunk, the next night you either slept in the deck or the hallway or someplace else. The next night back in the bunk. And uh, I don't know, it was five or six days, I guess it was, to get back. So we came back into, into New York Harbor on August the 2nd, 1945. I know that because it's my dad's birthday. Really? How about that? Yeah. So uh, we went from there to, um, from New York again, went down to Fort Dix. And they processed us, gave us our... 30 day pass, and uh, around midnight we finally got uh, 
we were able to leave Fort Dix, got the train back to New York, and went back home for 30 days. Uh, all on the 2nd of August. And uh, I married Marie on the 12th. So. Uh, that was a good day. Yeah, that was a good day. And uh, after the furlough was over, because we were still, the Japan War was still on, we were still scheduled to go to the Pacific. So when we came back to Fort Dix at the end of the 30 days, uh, they, uh, by this time now, the war was over because the war ended around the 15th, I think, of August, something like that. And, uh, but the orders were cut, so the whole outfit went out on a troop train to California. And again, we went to an a armored camp in Lompoc, California. And uh, uh, when we were there, because we all had so many points from all this time we were overseas and, and with the uh, few battle stars that we got, we had the points to all to get discharged. So we just had to wait our turn. Okay. And uh, while we were there, we just did nothing practically. Went, uh, finally, when the, when the time came, I went down to San Diego to I guess it was Fort MacArthur, I think, and there I was discharged. They gave me $150 to go back home. Gave me my pit. I'm glad, you, glad you're wearing it. Yep. I want to ask you a couple of questions before we move on. Uh, what was it like, both in your mind and what you saw going on, when you heard that the bombs had been dropped and the Japanese had surrendered? Oh. I thought it was a cat's meow because here we were scheduled to go there, and if this ended the war over there, that, this was this was good news to us. And uh, I have to give Truman a lot of credit for doing what he did because I don't know Trump might do it, but I know Obama wouldn't be doing it now. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. It was, it was quite a, quite an event. We had a wonderful celebration. I know when that, when that, uh, when the war ended. Yeah, and then, well, I don't know if you want to hear any more about. Yeah, I, I want to hear uh, a, a little bit just about the rest of your life. Just you don't have to go into detail about well, it. Well, okay. But just uh, when I got, like to get on the record. Yeah, when I got discharged, came back home, I thought to look for a job. I thought, boy, I'm a perfect candidate for the telephone company. So I went to New York Bell and this and that and all the other Bells, New Jersey Bell. They didn't want me. I had an uncle who worked for AT&T. He was an electrical engineer and I approached him and he said, oh, yeah, he says, uh, the, uh, uh, the head of the employment department used to work for me. I'll, I'll talk to him and set up a meeting. So uh, I, I went over there, and my uncle met me, and we went in, and he introduced me, and, and he told me, uh, you know, he told me everything about it. I told him what I had done and went to Brooklyn Tech, and which he was familiar with. And he says, uh, well, I'm going to do you a favor. I thought, oh, dig it, I'm going to get a job. He says, I'm not going to give you a job. He says, with your background and your experience and your knowledge, you should go to college. Huh. And so, of course, I went home, and this was a big decision for my wife and I and what have you. And uh, finally I went back to tech and I got my high school records and I asked them what school they would recommend, you know. And the, the man, I can't think of his name, in the school, he said, I would suggest you go to Clarkson University. It was Clarkson Tech at that time in Potsdam, New York, which was up almost on the Canadian border. 
And uh, it was strictly an engineering school, nothing else. And uh, I went up there and with my records and uh, snow covered, because this was like around Christmas time. I had gotten a job in the meantime at, at Western Union uh, working in the electrical lab as a lab technician. So I, we went up there, Marie and I, and uh, when, I, when we got there, of course, the snow was covering everything. You, know, you can't see the sidewalks, you can't see the streets. <coughs> uh, they told us where the school was, went up there, and the mailman was there. And I said, could you tell me where the office for Clark and Tech is? He says, right here, little tiny building, little tiny building. Not only was this the admissions office, this was the library. So. Uh, I went. I went in, and uh, saw Mr. Randell, and uh, he looked at the stuff and he says, "Okay, you can start." in, I think it was February, if I'm not, not mistaken. So uh, across the street from that was a much larger school. It was Potsdam State Teachers College. So Marie went over there and she got accepted and so she started before I did uh, at, at, at the State Teachers College. So in two years and eight months, going all through the year, you know, through, through the, you know, fully all the time, I graduated as an electrical engineer. Uh, got a couple of offers. One was with GE, the other was with Western Union. Since I had been with Western Union, and it was back home in New York. I, we thought, let's take that. So we went. To, I went to work for Western Union uh, as an engineer in their engineering department. And uh, not short, not too long after I was there, uh, they had a meeting. And the meeting was Western Union was struggling financially. And therefore, they were going to tell you right now there will not be any raises for at least two years. I was getting $325 a month. That was my salary. And uh, I thought to myself, gee, I can't be stuck here at $325 for two years before I can even think of saying anything. So I kept my eyes open. I saw an ad in the paper that DuPont was hiring. I went over at lunchtime and had an interview, and I got a job with DuPont. Uh, I was I went to work for them on uh, January the first, 1951. I graduated in '48, so I was with like with Western Union for a couple of years, and uh, uh, I was hired as a field inspector. Now, a field inspector's job was to inspect equipment that had been purchased by the company to be sent to the various plants and they found that this was advantageous to have these inspections because so often they found that there were discrepancies when the equipment got to the plant and then they had major things that had to be modified, uh, nozzles <coughs> on tanks and all of this kind of thing. So my job was, I worked out of at home, on, I was living on Long Island and uh, I used to go in that whole area, North Jersey, Connecticut, little upstate New York, and uh, inspected equipment that was going to the DuPont plants. Uh, about a year later, they called me into, into Wilmington, and I then became a technical inspector, which was the in-between man between the inspector and the design division. So when the inspector found discrepancies, he went through the technical inspector, who then worked with the design department to see if they would be able to accept the equipment with the whatever was wrong with it. And uh, I stayed there for a couple of few years, went to electromechanical research, hated it. Finally, they transferred me to explosive department and uh, went to the first plant that DuPont made outside of the Brandywine Mills, uh, Connie's Point. And that was a nitrocellulose plant. And uh, we had a few fires, one major explosion. One major explosion that 
I don't know how many men it wiped away. Um, and uh, finally, in 1970, I was I went to I went to Connie's Point in 1960. In 1970, uh, I was transferred to uh, Indiana, and there I was at a, a TNT plant, which where they they were starting to build. Stayed there for four years. Uh, I, at that point, I started to get interested in instrumentation rather than my electrical work. And uh, so I, I headed up both instrument and electrical and some mechanical crafts also in the construction of the, <laughs> of the plant. Uh, when, I first, when I first went to Wilmington, I worked on the Savannah River plant and uh, I made many trips down. I was never stationed down there, but I made many trips down there uh, doing various things. Uh, <coughs> when I, uh, when I, uh, oh, I thought I was, I was up to. I left, when, when the war ended in, in Vietnam, Nixon turned around and said, shut the plant down, the TNT plant in, in, uh, in Indiana. So we no sooner had just started it up, just started it, went into mothballs. So we, uh, I was then reassigned back to, back to Delaware. I went to work at the big DuPont plant at uh, Chambers Works. Uh, if you've ever driven past there, uh, gone through Delaware, like to New Jersey, as you go across the, the uh, Delaware Memorial Bridge, on the left-hand side is the big Chambers Works plant, which now has been practically cut to nothing, I'm told. I haven't seen it. And How much longer did you, did you work um, in your career? Okay, I stayed there 33 and a half years. Oh, wow. Then you retired. And I retired, and I'm retired longer than I worked. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> you got to be proud of that. Yeah. When did you move south? Well, Marie developed Alzheimer's. And thanks to Anne, uh, she found a very nice uh, home for her here. And so we moved Marie down here into the place I lived with with, with Ann then for a while, volunteered at St. Joe's Hospital. Oh. Uh, and there I met a lady. And so for the last 11 years, we've been living together. We are not married. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> and that kind of brings me pretty well up to date. Well, man, you've, you're having a, still having an amazing life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. Uh, I've been very, very lucky my whole life. I had wonderful parents. They gave me the independence that I needed. Uh, I know that they must have sacrificed something fierce with the things that they gave me. Uh, I was so lucky with, with my military career. Yeah. I only wound up a corporal, but, you know, I, I... I can't knock it. I, I had a very safe job. I was never shot at. Uh, but you performed an important function. I mean, communications. Oh was yeah, the, yeah, we did. Yeah, we really did. That, that was that's true. And before we finish, talk about your family, kids, grandchildren. Oh uh, well, I had we had two kids, Brian and Ann. Uh, there's Ann. And Brian R., he was a little older. Uh, he developed, well, he passed away at 17. He had an aortic aneurysm and died one, two, three. Uh, Ann has three kids, so those are the grandkids. And uh, I guess I got four great-grandchildren, so. Well, I know they're proud of you. Well, I don't know. 
<laughs> sometimes they sometimes they give me hell. <laughs> That's part of being a grandfather. Yeah. It stays yeah. in line. Though, yeah. Sure. <laughs> I want to be sure that nobody else has any questions. Uh, anything at all? Or anything that you want to bring up? I think I'm good. Okay. I think I'm good. Yeah, well, cool you. Experience. You've got an incredible story. Is there anything else you want to say in closing? Not really. As I said, I feel very, very fortunate in my, my life. Uh, had a couple of disasters. Uh, have a wonderful family. I got a son-in-law who I, I thought was a real Nothing, but he turned out to be the greatest guy you ever wanted to see. Boy, he is really a wonderful fella. And I am so lucky, and, and I'm sure Ann knows that she's lucky too with him and he with her. Uh, 46 years. <laughs> yeah, we were, to be said for that. yeah, we were married 58 years. Wow. She died of the Alzheimer's. 2003. So, anyway, I think well, I had. You've obviously had a lot of people that love you. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there are things in, in all my notes here that I've left out. Well, one thing I want to do before I close up is you've got that uh, picture of you. Yeah, on, well, on I, we really. I, th I think we need to get that on We the really should take the plastic off this thing, I think. And I believe it's your granddaughter who wrote yeah. about you, and that's written on there. If you can just kind of hold that up underneath yeah. your chin, there you go. Yeah, that was taken with me at oh. basic training in Tacoa, Georgia. Wow. Well, I do want to ask you, have you been up to Tacoa in recent I years? did. Yes. I did go up there. Ah. And there is nothing there. Back. Oh, there is nothing there. Uh, there is one little marker at the entrance to the camp. Uh, but I've heard that they are doing something up there. They are. I don't know what. They've but got when, some funding to, to rebuild some of the structures. Yeah. But I think there was only one building left, I think. When when I went, and that's going and back. That was, oh, that um, must be, that yeah, must be. That was when we first moved you here. Yeah, that must have been. I was going to say about 2004. Then, well, was before that, what? Well, anyway. Well, it's good that they're going yeah. to be. Yeah, they. Preserving. Yes, them. that's right. And it was. I went down there, and I just, I just, I couldn't visualize. Yeah. <laughs> The way it is, the way it is now, mm -hmm. as to way the way it was when we were there. Uh, well, it's been a real honor for all of us to be able to number one meet you, and number two hear your story. I mean, you, you got a tremendous work ethic. Uh, the way you described what you did when you were a kid and a young adult. I mean, you seem to be always working. Yeah. Ra rarely sleeping. Yep, that's um, true. You, you sure had a lot of good common sense. You, yeah. you got out of KP the whole time. Oh, yeah, I never. That's <laughs> well, impressive. I did have KP a few times, but <laughs> but uh, the real critical ones I, I avoided, <laughs> that was for sure. But, yeah. you know, you're, you're just a great example for all people in my generation and younger generations of the, the way you lived and the way you made it through the Depression and your family worked their tails yeah. off to, yeah. to give you a good life. And, yeah. You That's, obviously appreciate that because yeah. you talked about them and yeah. uh, you served your country and you you say you weren't in and battle. And grandchildren but, too. Uh, and his, grandchildren, yeah. My grandparents were outstanding to my brother and I. That's right. Yeah, they they really loved having the kids. They moved to Shelter Island, which is a very very nice location and off of Long Island, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, I was so glad that that they were able to retire to that place. I don't know how they ever scrounged enough money together to, to, to buy it, but 
they did, and they were very, very happy there. Oh, that's good. My dad went blind. I have a macular degeneration in one eye, but uh, so far, so good. Well, you do a great job of telling your story. Well, and thank you. It's, uh, you could probably write a book with all the adventures <laughs> you've had, and, and I know your family's proud of you, and it's been an honor for us to meet you and hear your story, and thank you for your service. Well, thank you for having me. I, I think it's very nice, and I hope that Somebody will enjoy hearing this someday. They will. They will. Okay. They will. Thank you. Take care. Right. Bye-bye.